Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us today. This is Nicole with Topaz and I am very welcome back Joel Wolfson. Hey Joel. Hey Nicole. Thank you so much for coming back and presenting. Joel's going to be showing us how he is using Topaz to uh, creatively style his images. So I know that he's going to be working with Restyle, our latest plugin, and possibly some others today as well. So super excited to see that. Let me tell you a little bit more about Joel and then I will turn it over to him. So Joel is a Southwest native and published internationally, and his roster of notable clients include Newsweek, L, 17, Houghton Mifflin, Family Circle, and corporate clients such as Apple, AT&T, 3M, and United Airlines, Chase, and Pillsbury, the list goes on. <laughs> his technical articles on digital imaging have been translated for use in more than 30 countries, yet he's best known for his artistic images of nature's fleeting moments, as well as abstracts and unexpected views of everyday places. He has presented in, at national conferences, written articles, and currently teaches photography workshops and seminars at his Flagstaff studio, as well as conducting workshops around the world. So with that, I will go ahead and turn this back over to you, Joel. Thank you, Nicole. Yes. Well, welcome, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, as always, I'm happy to be back. And I really enjoy these. And today I am going to address creative styling of your images. Uh, so by styling, I mean creatively crafting your images after capture. We try to do all we can when we capture the image. And those of you that have taken my workshops and know me know that I'm an, a big advocate of doing as much as you can in camera. But um, there's always the production after capture. And some of the stuff I'm showing you today uh, it, styling, I'm using the term a bit loosely. It can be anything from, you know, really, um, really special effects to just sort of um, moderately stylizing your image. But the bottom line is to have fun with this. And you know, sometimes we think about the technical things too much. But really, um, uh, in this in this one, I want to I want everybody to be having fun when they stylize their images. I'm going to be showing Restyle today, which is a a new a new plugin from Topaz. I'm really excited to be the first uh, guest photographer to show you guys this because I think it's really it really is a lot of fun. Um, I'll also probably show you Adjust, and I'll be using uh, Photo Effects Lab and Lightroom. And if there's uh, if I have time, I'll I'll show you uh, some stuff in black and white effects. So. Um, what I'm going to do is start out with the image that you see on the screen, and, and I'm showing this in Lightroom, which is my main hub for my digital photo life. I know a lot of you are already running Lightroom. Those who aren't, it's, it's worth a look. It's, um, it's a great way to sort of organize your digital images. And you can do basic adjustments in it. I'm not going to go too much into it other than to let you know the hub from which I'm working. So this is my base application. Some people are using, let's say, iPhoto or um, or other programs, Aperture, that sort of thing. Whatever you're using, that's fine. I'm just going to be showing you Lightroom today or from, from within Lightroom. So my, uh, my first image here is uh, New York City skyline. And obviously, I shot it at night, um, actually just after the sunset, so there's still a little bit of light in the sky. Um, it's a pretty solid image as far as you know, as far as New York skylines go. But I want to give it a little more pizzazz, and um, as I said, have a little fun with it. So I am gonna uh, take this into Restyle now. What I want to do is just mention my my little rule of thumb as far as using plugins through a host application. In this case, my host is Lightroom, um, and of course, the Topaz plugins work uh, nicely with several programs: uh, Aperture, Photoshop. I believe Photoshop Elements, iPhoto, they work with a whole bunch of programs. Um, but my little rule of thumb is if I'm going uh, from my host program and just using one plugin, I'll go directly from Lightroom and jump into whatever that plugin is. If I'm going to be using multiple plugins or for whatever reason the same plugin a few times, and in fact I'll show you that today. Uh, then I want to be able to have layers and masking capabilities. And for that, you can certainly use Photoshop if you have Photoshop. What I'll probably show you today is Photo Effects Lab, and that's a Topaz product 
And the same way that Lightroom is a hub for your digital images, uh, PhotoFX Lab is a good hub for the Topaz plugins, and you'll see that when I get to it. But let's, um, since I'm just going to use Restyle on this image, uh, I'm going to jump right into that plugin. And the way that Topaz allows you to do that is something called Fusion, Fusion Express, actually. So let me uh, let me let me jump into that. And and the way to do that is if you're on if you're in Lightroom, you can right click on a Mac or PC. If your Mac has a right click, if your Mac doesn't, it's a I believe Control click. And that gives me this drop down menu. I go to Edit In, and I go down to Fusion Express 2. And what's going to happen is it'll ask me what sort of image I want, whether a copy or the original. And of course, I always recommend making a copy of it. And so. While it's making the copy, it jumps into Fusion Express, and there's a list of all the plugins that I have installed. And in this case, we're going to use Restyle. And I hit Run, and it already made the copy of the image, and it's just going to jump into Restyle with that image. Now, the first thing I do when I jump into any of these plugins um, is I look for the Reset button, and in most cases, that's in the lower right-hand side. I hit Reset, and that brings me back to my original image, so I can just see where I'm starting from. Now, I'll talk about the interface a little bit. It's very similar to the other Topaz plugins. We've got on the left hand side here uh, a bunch of collections of presets. So they're sets of presets, so to speak, and they're divided into categories. So right now I'm on the night one. I can click whatever I want. So let's say we go to architecture. And you notice what happened underneath is these are the actual presets. Now, as I hover over those, you see I get a little pop out window and it gives me a little preview of what that particular preset is going to do. You may also notice that as I do that, a little green light appears to the right. If I go over these quickly, I can probably create some red lights, and then once the little preset uh, loads, um, it turns to a green light, meaning I can just go to that and use it. So that's over on the left. Over on the right are the controls. So um, there's two main panels. There's the Restyle panel, which is the crux of this program, and I'll show you what that does in a couple minutes here. And then we have a basic panel, which has things that look familiar, like adjusting your temperature and tint and your, um, your various tones, and there's a detail one in here for structure and sharpness. And um, I'll be showing you more of those as I go through this image. So that's the main layout across the top, um, similar to the, the other Topaz plugins, especially the newer ones. We have a one-to-one -one button, which uh, brings us to the one-to-one -one view. It has a preset applied. If I click on that, it gives me my before. There's my after. Uh, this shrinks it back down to fit the screen, and then the usual plus and minus to go up and down. I'm not going to go over every single feature on here because I would um, go over my time limit for sure. What I want to do is just run through an image and show you how I use this. Nicole actually has a good video with um, all the details if you want all the nuances of, of all the different controls in here. Um, I will be covering quite a few of them, but I, I just want to show it in practice more so than just going through each little feature. So what I want to do is um, get a starting point, and I do that with the presets. Now, what, what I want to say about Restyle is this this program is really all about the presets, and if I'm not mistaken, there are over a thousand presets that come with this, and I assume as time goes on and you get updates to this, there are going to be even more. So um, they've also built in a lot of great um, searching capabilities into these presets. So, um, and, and remember, we're just trying to have fun with this. So I'm going to start <clears throat> with the night. So I've got a set of presets. And what I'm going to do is show you, there's these little pop-outs. I, I find that if you want to look at a whole bunch of presets, that's kind of a hard way to do it. And that's just a personal preference. If you like this, that's great. You can scroll through these and look at them this way. I'm going to use this little icon. To the right of the presets, there's several little icons. And on the one on the far right, it gives you a grid. And you, I'm sure um, if you've used uh, some of the other plugins, you've seen this in some of the other plugins. So this gives me a grid view, and this way I can kind of scroll through and take a look at these. Um, I've got a night image, so these seem appropriate for night. And what I can do is, if I see a favorite right away, great. Let's say I go, oh, well, this one's kind of cool. 
Um, warm dusk. I'll try that. So I try warm dusk. Great. If I like it, I can. Uh, let me go back to the grid view. I'll just show you some of the controls here. So if if I like this warm dusk, I can make it a favorite um, by clicking on this little star, and the star turns blue. Now this favorite is saved. In other words, the next time I go to a new session of Restyle, um, all my favorites will be in there. You see to the left of that is a camera icon, which Topaz calls a snapshot. I like to think of this as a session favorite. So I might have some favorites in here that I might want to apply to this image. I wouldn't necessarily keep them for other images in the future. So if I just want sort of a session favorite, I can click on the little blue camera. So as I go through here, I can pick some session favorites, or I might pick something that I think would be an all time, you know, that I might use in the future too, and click on the blue star. And then I can filter those up on top. So if I click on the camera um, or the stars, the stars gives me the favorites, the camera gives me the session favorites. And then this thing with the checkbox will give me a session history. Now I only selected one, so there's only one in there. And um, if I've, let's say you try uh, five or ten of these. Uh, let me just go back to my image here. So if I if I went through some of these and let's say I try that one, I'm going to try Northern Lights. I'm going to try Dark Eggplant. So now um, I can do it in this list view too. When I click on that, it's going to show all the ones I just did, and that's handy because sometimes you go through a dozen of these and you go, oh man, the second one was my favorite. But out of these thousand total or maybe 25 in one collection, I can't remember the exact one. Um, so this this will just give you your session history, which is kind of nice. So all different ways to look at these images. Uh, I'm going to go back to the grid view, and I want to go to the night collection. So if you noticed up on top, I just went to a pull-down menu. So from within this grid view, I can go to any of the ones in this collection. I can even go to show all. And, of course, if I do show all, it's going to take a long time probably to render um, all those thousand of them. But where I find this useful is if I want to narrow it down with keywords. So I'm in the show all, which means everything's available to me. But let's say um, I want to just find ones for black and white. So in the keywords, I'll type in BW. And now it's going to bring up all of the ones that have, have black and or BW as the keyword. And that's like a quick and easy way to search through these. So this this is a really nice sort of search engine built into this thing. And I'm going to get rid of the keywords and I'm going to go back to the night because I think that's where I want to be. But this gives you an idea of some different ways to search this. So I like this orange stained Eve. I'm going to go with that as a starting point. At least I think I am. Let me go back to the night collection here. There's my orange stained Eve. And I do like the look of that one. Now, one thing I like about this is it has kind of an old film look. It almost looks like um, some film I may have shot in the 70s. And there was some reciprocity failure because I did a long exposure. And it also almost has a Polaroid look to it. If I, if I blow this up to one to one, um, and you look in the striations in the sky, um, to me that almost has a combination of that reciprocity and Polaroid fill. But whatever, I like, the, I like the feel of this thing. And now I just want to tweak it. Now what Restyle does is it kind of breaks the image into just a few colors. So it, it, it has, you can see over on the right here from primary down to fifth. So there are five colors and that's, and the image is made up uh, predominantly of those five colors and you can go in and make adjustments to them. Um, and that's, uh, um, and, and there's, there's just so many different things you need to experiment with this. It's, it really is a lot of fun to try these different ones. But I like this starting point. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'll show you how these sliders work because I want to tweak this thing a little bit. Um, I'm just going to magnify it a little bit so that you can see the sky in here better. And if you notice for each of these primary through the fifth colors, I can adjust hue, saturation, and luminance separately. So hue is the color of the color, if you will. If I take our primary color, which is sort of a brownish, purplish color, if I go all the way to the left, it goes very purple. All the way to the right, it goes very green. 
and so I can tweak this. And I think what I'm going to do on this one is I want to go. Um, I like that purplish. I'm going to go a little bit more that way, not too much. I just want to bring a little purple into the sky for that kind of sunset feel. And the secondary color, which is sort of an orangey brown, you can see what it's affecting by moving the slider all the way to the right or the left. And I'm going to move that just a little. If you if you watch um, here, look in the oranges right here in the sky, and you watch as I as I move this, it hits a point um, where it goes goes from slightly greenish to a little more orangey, and I like that. I like that a little bit more orangey feel. So I've kind of got the colors tweaked. Now I'm going to go to saturation, and I really do. I like the 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 color of this purple, so I don't want to play with the hue. I, I just want to make that more intense. So I'm going to bump up the saturation on this thing and really uh, make that sky sing. So I really like the way the sky looks. To be honest, I'm not that crazy about how these buildings look down here. The, the whole image is a little more monochromatic, but I can change that. So I want to get rid of sort of the, the predominance of that orangish feel in the buildings here, so I need to isolate the buildings. Well, I can do that with mass, and what's really cool about Restyle um, is that they've, hard to believe, but Topaz has added even more um, masking capabilities into this program, and I'm actually pretty excited to, to see them going in that direction and hope it migrates into, into the, um, the other products, too. Uh, I, I've always liked Topaz for the masking, and now they really have um, added a lot of capabilities. I could spend an hour just on masking, which I won't. But I'll show you um, real quickly that in, in addition to the normal and edgeware, there's now a color aware brush where you can brush in or out um, just based on a particular color. Uh, and there's something similar to that, which I'm going to show you right now, which is color range. So first I'm going to turn on my masks. I'm going to go to color range. And you can see over here, there's this little green target dot in the center. And wherever I move that, it it will select just that color. So if I put it on the yellows, uh, on this yellow orange of this building, you can see in the mask, um, it's it's just selecting that. Actually, it's it's blocking that because I had. Let me get back out of the um, out of this and show you. There's I, I forgot to mention the hide and reveal. So hide um, meaning it's whatever whatever I select through the masking, it's going to block it. Reveal, it's going to reveal it. So I'm going to go back to the color range, and I'm going to move this dot into the buildings because that's kind of what I want to mask out. So you can see it created an instant mask up here, and it pretty much selected quite a few of the buildings. And you can see right in here, I got rid of a lot of that predominantly orange color in the buildings. Now what's even cooler about this color range is I can tweak it further. So what I can do. Um, I can increase the size of the mask and change the sensitivity. Now, the size is is just sort of what it implies, based based on that color. It's 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 creating a bigger mask, a bigger spread. And then what the sensitivity does is it it determines how how sensitive it is to a color. In other words, if I go to very low sensitivity, um, it's going to select almost everything because it's taking that color plus everything around it. And as I go to the far right, it's going to be very precise about that color. So I'm going to go sort of in the middle here. And that gives me a pretty good mask. If you look up in, at the top here in the mask section, uh, you can see most of the buildings are black, which means the effect is being hidden, which is exactly what I wanted. I like the sky. I wasn't crazy about what it was doing to the building. And if you want a before and after of what just the mask is doing, I can go to the checkbox, uncheck the mask, there's before my applying the mask, and there's what the mask applied. So that's great. The only thing I want to do here now is I, I still would like to make these buildings look a, a little bit better, although they don't have all that orange in there. They need a, a little more zip color-wise, and they also need um, a little more contrast and some blacks in there because it is a night scene and it's looking just a little bit flat. So I'm going to close the restyle box, and I'm going to go down to basics. And a lot of these controls will look familiar. Um, and you notice at the bottom there's another 
mask panel here, which allows me to do a whole separate mask for just the basic controls, which is really cool. So I'm going to click. Uh, what I want to do now is I want to isolate the buildings. So I could create a whole new mask, but I have the other one that I created in Restyle, which blocks out the buildings and doesn't affect the sky. I want the opposite of that. So there's a cool way to do this. In, in this set of buttons here, which has the undo, redo, all that sort of thing, at the far right, there's one that allows you to copy a mask. First, I want to make sure that I actually applied my mask, if that's important. Um, you notice in that color range thing, you have to hit OK when you're done with that. I forgot to do that, so I just want to make sure I did it before I try to use that mask. And what do I mean by use that mask? Well, I can make a new mask based on the one from Restyle. So I click on this mask button, go down to Restyle, voila, it makes a duplicate of the mask. But what I want is the opposite. So I can go to the Invert button here, click that, and I've inverted my mask. We haven't seen any changes to the image because I haven't done anything in the basic panel yet, but I'm about to do that. So um, temperature does just what it says, you know, cooler, warmer. Um, it's not bad the way it is. I might just um, go just a little bit less on the tint here, uh, a little bit more towards the green. And then I probably, in the tones here, I'm going to bring the black level down just a little bit because it is a night image. I want to get some blacks back in here. So if I if I undo this tone, you can see that's before, that's after. And I'm also going to bring up the saturation a bit on these buildings so that it matches the sky a little better. So now you're really getting a sense when I saturate this and adjust this, the colors in the buildings down here, it's, it's as if they're catching the purples off of the sky. And I much prefer that to the oranges. If you look, there's still a little bit of orange in there, too, so it kind of looks like it's really taken the color off of that sky. Now, the other thing I like that, um, that they've added to this is the structure, and that's sort of almost like a clarity slider of sorts. And as I move that up, you can see I move it all the way over. You know, watch the buildings. As I move it back, the buildings flatten out. As I move it to the right, to the higher numbers, it really does essentially add structure, but sort of almost like a mid-tone contrast or a clarity slider. So I'm going to add a little bit to that. And I think that looks great, and I think we're, uh, we're pretty much done with that image. So I'm going to say, OK. It's going to apply all that. Drop me back into Lightroom with my new image. There's the before, and there's the after. Definitely what I was looking for. It's Got a lot more pizzazz, and it's a fun image. It really has that retro look with kind of that really old film look to it. I'll just do a, a quick compare here. And there you are. So um, that shows you uh, a fair amount of restyle and just one way to do something with an image. And what I'd like to do is show you a few other things here. And maybe using some plugins you might, you may or may not necessarily think of when you're uh, when you're trying to stylize your images. So the next image I want to do is this one here. Now, <clears throat> a lot of the images I do, uh, I have people tell me that they have a painterly feel to them, and that's kind of one of my trademarks. So this image here, um, although it's a straight photograph. It does have a little bit of a painterly feel to it, especially because of these wispy clouds. Um, this is in Tuscany, and uh, of course a bunch of hay bales, and you can see in the background there's a villa with the uh, sort of classic Cypress Line Drive going up to it. So as long as it has a painterly feel, let's sort of take that to the limit and sort of make a painting out of this. What I'm going to go for is something like this. Okay, so almost like a watercolor feel. So that's, that's what we're going to go after here, and I'll show you how I did that. Now, with this one, I'm going to use more than one plugin. For one thing, this, this image was taken straight from a RAW file, so it's a little bit flat and lackluster, which is typical of RAW files. Um, and so one of my go-to applications for that, or plugins, is Adjust to um, 
use the adaptive exposure and bring a little pizzazz back into a little bit more the way I saw the scene than this sort of somewhat flat looking thing. Uh, and I'm also going to use um, a plugin called Simplify, which is aptly named because it takes it takes details and it simplifies them. It, it uh, eliminates small details and it um, renders the other ones kind of like you saw in that painterly feel and there's all different variations we can do on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do my right click again, go to edit in, and this time I'm going to use Photo Effects Lab. Because I'm using, um, I'm going to do two passes with Simplify plus adjust, so we're uh, going to need a minimum of three layers. And uh, for that reason, I need to use something that has layers. So I'm going to use Photo Effects Lab, which is from Topaz. Again, this is the hub I was talking about for your plugins. And it's really neat because it allows you access to the plugins and you can just jump in and out of them. And you also have the um, layer and masking capabilities that you'd see in something like Photoshop. And a lot of what I'm going to show you how I'm doing this here, those of you that have Photoshop, it'll, it'll be almost identical in the way I do it. Um, the interface on the left, again, there's a bunch of presets, and these presets are ones you can apply and create um, from any plugin. When I hit the Plugins tab, here's all the plugins, which I guess I have quite a few. So all the plugins that you have installed in your system will show up here. So if you have five, you'll see five of them, or however many you have. If you have all 14, they'll, they'll show up there. Over on the right, um, like with most plugins, are the controls. Um, now, what I want to do is create a new layer, because I don't want to work on the original. So over on the bottom here are where my layers and um, masks are. So the, the blank white to the right of the image is the mask, which right now is on 100% reveal. So I, I'm going to drag and drop this to duplicate, and it duplicates the image. And the first thing I like to do is relabel these. So I'm going to relabel this, and I'm going to call this Adjust 5, because that's what I'm going into. And this just reminds me what I did with it so I know how I created that layer. And I'll go over to the left here, and here's Adjust 5 up here. And whatever layer is selected, that's the one in blue. So I could select either layer. That's what it. That's the one that's going to go into the plugin. So I'm going to start adjust five. And like I do with all the plugins, I look for the, my reset button, and then I'm going to reset it. So I start with my original image starting point. And really, all I'm going to be doing in adjust is just to pop this thing a little bit. Um, and for that, one of my favorite presets is up in the classic collection here. And it's called Photo Pop. And when I click on that, essentially it's adding uh, some adaptive exposure. And it does give it a little more pop. And it's a little closer to how my original image looked when I saw the scene, essentially, rather than that little bit of flatness I get from the original RAW file. So that's pretty good. I might just add a tiny bit more adaptive exposure. So under the global adjustments, you have all these different panels, and adaptive exposure is really the heart of this program. So you see if I, if I move the adaptive exposure all the way to the right, <laughs> it, gets, it gets pretty funky. So um, I don't really want that grunge look. I'm looking for something a little more natural. Um, that's basically nothing. And the photo pop gives it uh, essentially 27% here. I'm going to bump it up a little bit. The regions divides this into a grid, so it's it's applying that adaptive exposure to 22 squares. So if you just think of it as graph paper divided into a grid, um, if I go to one region, it's it's trying to do adaptive exposure on everything as as one. Um, if you have a bunch of different, basically my rule of thumb is if you have a lot of different tonalities and brightnesses in the same image, then you want to be using more regions. So I believe it was around 20 to begin with, which is just fine for this. I'm going to add a little bit more adaptive exposure. And I think that's pretty good. I'll just look at it fit. So that's our starting point. I'm just going to say, OK. It'll take us right back into uh, Photo Effects Lab. And now this is going to be my new base image. So this is where we started. All I did was add a little photo pop and some adaptive exposure uh, in adjust and I'm going to duplicate this layer and the next one I'm going to use is simplify 
So I'm going to label it as such. We're going to use simplify now. I'm going to call this simplify background and I'll explain that in a second. Let's take a look at this image. I'm going to go to one to one. Now if you look at this image, there's a ton of foreground detail. It's very, very detailed in the foreground. Uh, we can see every strand of hay and everything in there. Now if you look towards the background, it's pretty simple. It's there's you know not not as fine a rendering. Things are further back, things are not quite as sharply rendered, and it's pretty much about shapes and forms. So it's already approaching painterly to begin with. And so I'm going to run into a conundrum, and you'll see what I mean when I go into simplify. Because if I already have something that's simple and I simplify it even more, it might get um, a little too basic looking, and you'll see what I mean in a second. So I'll just jump into simplify, whereas the foreground, we're going to have to give it a different treatment. Fortunately, I can do layers and masking, so that won't be a problem. And just to explain this, I'll go into simplify so you can actually see what I'm talking about. Again, we see that familiar interface. Um, here's our sets of presets on the left. Um, collections. Uh, we have this thing called BuzzSim. We have all these other ones, and I'll, I'll kind of start on the painting one. Again, I like to first thing go to that lower right, hit the reset button so that I'm at my starting point. And this is slightly different than the, than the newest plugins because it uses a little thumbnail up on top to give you previews as you scroll over these as opposed to the little pop-out. But it, it, the, the net effect is the same. You can get a little preview of these. So the one I like to start with is oil painting. And honestly, um, if we blow that up, to me it's a little more watercolorish than oil, but um, I like it as a starting point. Now, Simplify processes every single pixel, so you'll see when I move this box around, um, every time I move it around, you see that progress bar on the bottom processing, so um, there's a lot of processing going on. Um, there's our before. I'm holding down the space bar so you can see the before. There's the after. And what I want you to see here is, we're waiting for the progress bar again because I just moved it around. I think the sky in this background looks great. That's exactly what I'm going for in terms of a painterly look. The foreground where we have all that detail, um, it's almost a little more like an etching or line drawing or something like that. So our foreground is a little bit mismatched the background, at least for what I'm going for here. Um, if you like that, great, you're done. But what I want to do is have the foreground and the background sort of match that little bit of watercolory feel to it. So I'm just going to say, say OK. And um, you'll notice that when we go back into Photo Effects Lab, because Simpl Simplify is processing every single pixel, it does take a little bit of time for it to do it. So there we are. Uh, we've got just what we saw in Simplify. I'm going to um, now create another layer. And remember, our, all right, here's, here's the before. That's the one that we did in Adjust. Here's After. But what I want to do is I want to duplicate the Adjust 5. That's our base layer. And we're going to use, I'll click that other one back on. So there's our Adjust 5 copy. I'm going to relabel that. We're going to go into Simplify again. And I'm going to call this one Foreground. So I'll jump back into Simplify. And I'll show you how we're going to use masking to combine these when I'm done. So again, reset all. And I'm going to stay in my painting presets here. I'm going to scroll down to the bottom here. There's these, there's these watercolor ones. And I'm going to, um, we can look at watercolor. There's watercolor, and then there's watercolor for two. And you can see it gives it um, actually a pretty different effect. But... I'd say this watercolor too in the style is closer to what we had in the background on the other one. The only thing I see about this now, I'll blow it up a little bit, is it's got the right feel for that paint texture. Um, it's not quite as, as snappy. So what I can do is go to these drop downs. Remember, like almost with all the plugins, the controls are on the right. I'm going to go into global adjustments 
and you see there's a tab here called Adjust. And that gives uh, some pretty familiar controls here. The main thing I'm going after here is saturation. I'm going to bring up the saturation a bit. Yeah, maybe just a tad more. Because I want it to, you know, now the colors match better. Um, I'm going to touch on this Simplify just a tad. Um, the way Simplify works, this is a key to it right here, is the Simplify size. Now, when you hover over, it gives you an explanation. This is true of almost all the plugins. It defines the size of the detail being simplified. So basically, if I use a higher number, smaller details are just going to be um, thrown out, and it's just going to work on the bigger details. If I go to a lower number, it's going to work on every little detail, and it almost still looks like a photo there. If I go the other way, you can see um, it it only works on the largest things. So um, I kind of forgot where I was, so I'm going to go back to my watercolor 2 setting. Anyway, that's so I can make those adjustments. Like with the first one, I could have adjusted that simplify size to make the foreground look right, but then the background goes um, almost like a line drawing. So that's why we're combining the two. And I want to go back into my adjust and get that uh, saturation back. So I'm going to Somewhere around there, I want the colors to match. I say OK. And now we're going to process this image, and you'll see that we'll have what's going to um, go to this. This is the layer. I don't know what happened here. Oh, I see. I had the wrong layer on top. So the top layer was our background, and I should have looked at my own labels. And this is the foreground. So we want to block one out and reveal the other. And you can do it in either order. So um, here is where we like the background. Here is where we like the foreground. Now, if you look at the background, you can see um, it's, it, it, it's not quite enough detail, which is why we're combining them. So what I'm going to do is click on this mask. And what we want to do is get rid of the foreground stuff so that that foreground image that we already created will, will show through. So a brush value of zero means it's going to be complete black. It's going to block out this layer and reveal what's below it. So let me just go down in size here. And here you can adjust the brush size. I'm doing, I can use a fairly broad brush here. Um, the hardness, these are all pretty self-explanatory. They're, they're in a lot of different programs, including things like Photoshop. So I'm just going to go through here and brush all this through. Um, I'm going to go get a little bit smaller brush to get these edges right here. And now if I magnify this, and we move it around, you can see our styles match. So now we have a, our foreground style matching our background style, and we're pretty much done with this. So if we go back to the two images, I'll just compare the two. There's, there's our before, there's our after. Let's look at those side by side. So we took something with a painterly feel and kind of turned it into a painting. It's pretty cool. And a lot of us don't uh, think about some of these other plugins. I know a lot of you have the whole sets, but you know they really are a lot of fun. The other thing, I didn't spend a lot of time in adjust, but take a look at that sometime because you can do some really funky styling with just the adjust. Um, look, look at the collections and um, and play with those too. I highly encourage you to do that. So I may, I think what I'm going to do here is um, I will try to go. Th show you um, a sepia tone very quickly. I'll try to make it very quick anyway. Um, now that we've seen two totally different effects, Restyle, which is just awesome for doing all kinds of really neat stuff and fun stuff, and we saw uh, using Simplify to make something look like a painting. So <clears throat> something I do a lot, a, a, a stylized effect I do a lot, is sepia toning. So converting to black and white and then making a sepia tone. So here's my starting image. And I, I'm just going to move this over here. Here's where I want to end up. So 
that's the, that's where I'm starting, and this is where I want to end up. So I want a sepia tone. Um, uh, because this is a this is the uh, Duomo in Florence, the main cathedral in Florence, and it's a very old building, almost 600 years old. And the reason I want to do black and white is just to give it that kind of match the building, give it kind of a retro look, and kind of like a film edge look too. With um, and I can do all that right from within black and white effect. So I think with this one, I'll just pop right into black and white effects directly. So we use Fusion Express, makes a copy of the image, and we'll go into black and white effects. And I'll go through this pretty quickly because I want to allow a few minutes at the end here for some questions. So I'm going to re that's that's sort of what I did last time, but I'm going to reset it because I want to show you the process now. You have black and white effects is a very powerful program. It's just awesome for black and white. There's so many capabilities, and I wish I had the time to show you more. Um, if you look at my website in my workshop section, I, I've archived the webinars that Topaz has sponsored that I've done for Topaz, and um, I did cover black and white effects fairly extensively in there. So you can you can always take a look at it there, at least as far as seeing all the various controls. So Again, the same kind of layout collections. Um, here's all our different styles. Now, what this defaults to is the neutral gray scale. I tend to, um, let's just go into the grid so you can see that. This is the same grid that you saw in, uh, similar to Restyle. And what I tend to usually like um, as a starting point is the classic. So if I hold down the space bar, there's my before. That's just a very straightforward conversion to black and white. There's classic, which is just adds a little more contrast. The other thing I might want to do here um, is add a color filter. So to make the sky even a little more dramatic, I can add a yellow filter. Um, it defaults to somewhere in, in the yellowish range, I guess. Um, you can see you have a, a scale here. Red is going to make the sky the, the darkest. I want a little less than that. I'm going to go into the yellowish range here with the slider. Um, and then I'm going to bring the strength way down because that's just too much. I just want just a little just a little bump. If, if I use too much strength then there's too much emphasis on the sky and I really want the emphasis on the cathedral itself, on the Duomo here. So there's my before, there's my after. Um, now we've got some nice pop on that. The next thing I want to do is um, go to my finishing touches where I'm going to do most of the rest of this and go into the silver and paper tone, which is where I can create all different kinds of toning. Now, this is just my thing, but I don't use the paper hue very often. So I'm going to take the paper strength and the paper hue down to zero. The silver tone, I find for sepia tone, uh, a value somewhere between 26 and 28 is pretty good for sepias. If, um, so I'll just move it somewhere in that range. And you can see as um, I bring up the tonal strength up here, I get a little more of a sepia look. Um, you notice there's silver tone strength too. And since I'm only using just um, the silver, um, the, the overall tonal strength and silver tone strength are going to do similar things. So it's not necessarily that critical which slider you use. I kind of like the look of that. I've got my sepia, so the last uh, thing, I, two things I need to do, I'm going to throw a vignette on here. Um, and the vignettes, let me scroll down so you can see this. And I'll, I've got my toning done. I'm going to close that up. So when I click on the vignette, it throws a fairly severe one on there. The way I, the way I use this thing is that the first thing I do is bring the strength down to minus one, which is the maximum. And that way you can see what the rest of these controls are doing. So, you know, here's the size, right? Here's the transition, which is how soft the edges are. If I go down here, it's a very um, defined edge, which I don't really use that one. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the transition all the way up to the softest. And then the curvature is all the way to the left is round. All the way to the right is more square. So because it's such a soft transition, uh, I'm going to leave it on the squarish one because I just want it on the edges. Now that I have all that um, 
adjusted, so I'll bring my size out here, then I, then I can go back to a, a more reasonable strength, which is maybe somewhere around there. So there's before the vignette, there's after, and I just want enough to keep the emphasis on that, um, on that, on the center of the building, on the on the tall tower there. So all I'm trying to do is help the viewers viewers eye go there. Now the last thing I want to do is give that sort of film edge look, and I do that with the border control over here. So if I click on border, it'll default to the first one in the list, which is the solid white. If you click on this, you will see there are all kinds of different borders. And again, it gives, a, gives you a little preview as you go through these. So as I go through these, you can see there's all kinds of different borders that you can do. So I like the grungy black and white way up here. And I think the number two is about what I'm looking for. All I really want to do is increase the size of the border. So I do that right here. You can see I can make it pretty large, down to nothing. But I want a little breathing room there so you can see that sort of pseudo film edge look that I'm going for. So that's it. I say OK. And it pops it back down into Lightroom here. So I'll show you that. There's the before. There's where we started. A color image is pretty punchy. I created as much drama as I could for a sunny day. Uh, polarizing filter, extreme angle. Um, but I really like that kind of classic old world look. Um, because this building is so timeless, and that's the reason I do sepias a lot, is, is with these timeless images, especially when you're shooting architecture in Europe where this stuff has been around for hundreds of years, um, it's, it's kind of neat to create that sort of timeless feel to it. So I wish I had more time because this stuff really is a lot of fun, but you know, definitely take a look at Restyle. You know, we took this image, turned it into that one. Um, I used uh, Simplify to uh, turn this image into more like a painting. And then, of course, we just did um, something that I actually do fairly often. But using black and white effects, I was able to convert to black and white, make it sepia, add a border, add a film edge, add a vignette. Very, very powerful program. So we've got uh, um, maybe 10 minutes left or so. I'd like to open it up to questions that people have. All right, thank you so much. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine, and, and thank you all. Um, I'll, I'll answer some questions now. OK, great. Let's see here. I have several coming in. If you do have any questions for uh, Joel or his, his workflow or imagery, uh, definitely uh, type it into your questions module now, and I'll try to get it answered here. All right, I had a couple questions about Pro photo versus sRGB. I see one here from John. He says, "What are the advantages and disadvantages of keeping the image in Pro photo versus sRGB for you?" Excellent question, John, and I get asked that one a lot. Basically, what we're talking about is color space, and I, it's kind of an esoteric term, but basically, Pro photo gives you a wider range of colors and tones. sRGB was designed many, many years ago, and it was designed for the very first color monitors, and um, it, it's a very basic standard. So basically, ProPhoto RGB is much closer to human vision in terms of the number of colors and tones it can render, and it's also closer to what digital cameras can do. So um, if you want to take advantage of all the tones and color that your digital camera can see, the best thing to do is to keep it in the pro photo working space as long as you can. When you finally get out to, let's say, a print, um, most printer, there aren't any printers out there really that can print pro photo RGB. But if you convert it to sRGB early in the process, you may be clipping out colors that your printer can actually produce. Um, so that's the main reason for keeping, uh, for using pro photo RGB. All right, thank you. Sure. We also had a ton of people ask um, about the masking that you did in Restyle and asked if you could quickly kind of go back over that, just the masking portion of that, um, that workflow, how you did one mask and then switched it onto and inverted on the other mask. Yes, I did go through that uh, somewhat quickly. So let me just, I'm going to... Um, and this is recorded, everybody, just so you know. You can watch it again as well. So, 
I will I will go through that because that is that is an important feature, and restyle. As I mentioned, Topaz has gone to a lot of work to really add a lot of neat masking capabilities to it. So what I what I did here is um, I'll just leave that image where it is. I created the if, if, first of all restyle in the color style palette here has its own mask and then basic has a separate one and the advantage of that is you can adjust those things separately so we're in restyle I'm adjusting things like the hue and the saturation of these um, of these various colors let me actually apply one of these so that we can see it so um, I may want to adjust these other things separately and that's why there are separate masks so <clears throat> when I created the mask in um, in the top portion here, I used what's called color range. Now you saw how I did the masking in Photo Effects Lab, and I think people have seen that a lot, uh, where you where you brush in the mask. What I did here was is called color range, and it's based on a color. So um, I have that this little green target dot, and let's say I'll put it up in the purple in the sky you can see that's what it's masking out okay so because I, I originally had hide it's hiding whatever is in that color range so it's picking out sort of that purplish blue and anything that's purplish blue is getting masked um, you can adjust the sensitivity of that down here so if you make it less sensitive it'll use a looser definition of what's blue and purple and whatever that color is and, and the less sensitive you go the looser it is with that definition and you can see it happening in the mask you're taking in more and more and as I make it less sensitive it isolates that blue more so if I go all the way over it's exactly the color that I put that dot on no more no less that it's going to mask out if I put it on uh, let's say the green here on the uh, Empire State Building it's it's you can you can barely see it in the mask there but you can see it's just taking just the green of just that building um, if I bring the sensitivity down uh, it brings in a little more but it's based on whatever I have this dot on. So that's what the color range does. Um, so if, let's say, we do the sky like this, um, I could bring up the sensitivity to about the middle. So I, I'm mostly selecting the sky, and then I can increase the size of that mask so it's expanding on the definition of the color I determined in sensitivity from that dot, if that makes sense. So it's increasing the size of it based on that on what I did so now I've got all of the purple and blues in the skies now let's say um, what I did in down here in basic um, is I wanted to adjust things separately so I don't want to affect the sky I want the opposite of that I can copy masks from one portion to another so between uh, the basic panel and the restyle panel I can I can copy masks. So that's what I did with this button over on the far right. Um, that's where I can copy it. And I say, take the mask from restyle. Whoops, you know what I forgot to do? Sorry, I did it again. My master, I forgot to hit, a, hit the OK button to apply it. OK. So now I've applied it. And I go down here to this mask. And I say, copy that one from restyle. So it copies it exactly the same way. Now I can go in and alter that. I can even go in and take. Um, let's take a brush and and just start filling in more of the sky. And you can see as I brush over this, you can see it filling in on the mask. Okay, so I did kind of a sloppy filling in the sky. Um, and so what's white is what's going to be revealed. So if I adjust things in the basic panel, it'll affect just what you see in white, and it won't affect what's in black. If I want the opposite of that, I go to this button third from the right and I invert the mask. So now everything in white is the sky and it just did an inverse. So I based the mask on the, on the uh, color style one on top. I inverted it and so now if I do any adjustments up here, let's say we ch change the color temperature, it's just going to be affecting the sky. You can see as I move this slider and that's because the rest of it is masked out. So um, and as I mentioned before, there are so many other capabilities in this, and I wish I had time to go over them all. But another one that I really like is the color wear brush. 
and it works the same way essentially as that color range. You can sample a color. Let's say I sample the green, and it's only going to affect the green um, when I when I brush with that with the brush. So you can see um, if if you look carefully in the mask, I brushed over a lot of different stuff, but it it only filled in the green with white there. So very very powerful masking capabilities, and I I hope that helps explain it a little better. All right. Well, that was an awesome explanation. Thank you very much. Let's see here. You're Everyone welcome. is saying thank you. <laughs> You're all welcome, and um, I can stay in a couple more minutes for some more questions. Uh, we had a few people ask what your top uh, Topaz plugins were, if these were your top ones. Uh, oh, you know, that's such a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say my go to, you know, it kind of depends what I'm doing, but in terms of like general purpose, like stuff that I might do to a lot of images or almost every image. My go-to's are, would be adjust, clarity, um, detail. And um, and I do use Photo Effects Lab a lot. It's technically not a plugin. It's a standalone program to manage all the plugins. But it's such an easy way to jump in and out of plugins and to see what they do and, and just create layers for it and everything that uh, sometimes it's even though I have Photoshop and I use Photoshop, sometimes it's it's actually easier because of the interface to just use Photo Effects Lab. And certainly, if you don't own a you know own Photoshop, it's a lot less expensive way to be able to do those things. But as far as my top ones, I'd say it's those. Um, obviously, if I'm doing something um, you know for uh, more for special effects or just for fun, then I, then I'm using things like I showed you today, like Restyle and Simplify. They're, they're not ones necessarily that I would use every day, but they sure are a lot of fun and they, and they have a lot of uses. And, I, and honestly, I'm still discovering more and more uses for Restyle, so I, mm. just, I just think it's really a lot of fun. All right, thanks. Uh, Glenn had asked earlier if you prefer 8 or 16-bit files um, when you finish JPEG or TIFF. What's your usual workflow there? Well, my usual workflow is um, I'm, I talked about Profoto RGB a little earlier, and and in that same vein, I I, I stick with 16-bit all the way through to output. Now, normally my output is printing because I you know I sell my fine art images. Um, obviously, I use the web too, but um, it, it's just as a good rule of thumb, I, I keep it I, I keep as much information as possible for as long as I can, and that means using Profoto RGB, 16-bit color, and um, shooting in RAW, of course, and maintaining that as far as I can through the whole process. And for instance, I print out of Lightroom. I can print in 16-bit. My printer allows it. Lightroom allows it. So I can actually print in 16-bit. And you really do have a lot of advantages. Now, if you're just going out to the web, you know that's kind of lowest common denominator, and you can you can certainly use JPEG. And I do a lot of times I'll shoot JPEG along with RAW just as a reference because RAW you get those kind of flat looking things, and JPEG you can adjust your camera to you know make them punchier if you want, or just to try to give you something. You can do a natural looking one to try to give it a little more of the look of what you saw. So um, that's just kind of a personal choice. But in terms of getting the utmost quality. Um, especially if you're going out to print, uh, you do want to keep it in the highest color space, the highest bit depth for as long as you can. Thank you so much, Joel. Really appreciate it and getting some awesome feedback. And we'll have this online for everyone to watch through the follow-up emails here within a couple hours if you want to rewatch. But thank you again, Joel. I really appreciate you coming back and presenting. Well, thank you, Nicole, and thank you everyone for attending. I. Uh, I had a good time with this and, uh, and hope to come back again and do another webinar for you guys. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon, evening, morning, whatever, <laughs> wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> and we will be talking to you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.